But I'm really up here this morning. My name is Gary Campbell. I'm the lead pastor here. And it is my privilege today uh, to introduce our speaker for the morning, uh, Alan Patton, who will be coming in just a moment. Uh, Alan and his wife, Tanya, have been here for decades and have been faithful servants here at the chapel. In fact, in their relatively uh, early stages of their marriage, they were my small group leaders at youth group here when I was in high school. Uh, and they've served in a host of ways around the church, usually in kind of behind the scenes functions. You'll often see them in the booth and uh, places associated with that, and Alan's involved with Celebrate Recovery, and he'll talk a little bit about this, that this morning. But uh, would you, this morning, welcome uh, to the platform to bring us God's Word, Alan Patton. Alan, if you come. Well, good morning, everyone. It is great to be here today, and I'm looking forward to sharing with you the things that God's put on my heart. It's been quite a bit this time around. Well, I want to start today with a question. Can you recall a time in your life when you were absolutely certain something was going to happen and then it didn't? Well, maybe the thing you were expecting was a catastrophe of some sort. And when that didn't materialize, you were relieved or overjoyed. Maybe that relief brought you to your knees. Or perhaps the thing you were expecting was something wonderful. And when that didn't happen, you were disappointed, sorrowful, or worse. Maybe that sorrow brought you to your knees. And maybe the thing that you expected to happen was the exact opposite of what eventually did. I would guess most of us here can think of examples of like that, like that from our lives. But for me, one of my earliest recollections happened when I was in the fourth grade. So it was the day before Christmas break, and our teacher had planned a holiday party for us. Everyone had been instructed to bring in a wrapped gift for an exchange, and the teacher had stacked those presents in two piles on a table at the back of the classroom. You see, this was in the days before gender-neutral toys. So all of the boys had brought in a boy's gift, and all of the girls had brought in a girl's gift. And the teacher had also told us not to tell anyone what we brought in, that it would be more fun if we were surprised. Well, of course, nine and 10-year-olds, we weren't that good at keeping secrets, especially at Christmas. And by the time that party was about to start, most of us knew what was inside most of those gifts. <laughs> well, there was one gift in particular that I wanted badly. It was a plastic model kit, part of a series that I had been collecting, and I did not have this one yet. It was the creature from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> now, trust me, I was not the only boy in the class that wanted that model, including my fourth grade nemesis and sometimes tormentor, Ricky Olson. Wow, I still say his name that way. Uh, <laughs> So here's how the gift exchange worked. The teacher had numbered each stack of gifts from one to however many gifts there were, and then put duplicate numbers into two bowls, one for the boys and one for the girls. Bowl comes to me, I reach inside, look at my number, and I cannot believe my luck. It was like a scene from Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. I had the number that was on that box, number eight. When the teacher calls the number, I'm out of my seat like a shot, doing my triumphal walk to the front of the classroom. Apparently, I'd never read the, the verse in the Bible that says, pride cometh before a fall, because as she passes me that present, I look at it, and it's not the model. The size, the shape, the wrapping paper, everything is different, but there on the box, written as clear as day, is the number eight. I didn't know what to do. I took the gift. I sat down. W what had happened? And no, I did not get one of the girls' gifts by mistake. I was spared the embarrassment of opening up a Barbie doll in front of my friends. But what happened was, as the teacher picks up the last boy's gift from the table, she looks at it and says, oh, I made a mistake. I must have written number eight on two of the boxes. Who still needs a present? Guess who? Ricky Olson. Now, just moments before this, I would have told you with 100% certainty that I'd be taking home that model that day. I had the number in my hand. Instead, I took home an early life lesson. But isn't that how life often is? We go through our days expecting things will be a certain way, and then life throws us a curveball. We end up in a place that we hadn't expected well, as we look today at Isaiah 43, we're going to see Israel in a similar situation. They've been exiled from their homeland, taken captive by the Babylonians, 
already having lived decades in a faraway land, seemingly alone and without hope. And maybe some of you are feeling that way this morning, having found yourself in a place you never expected. Where do we turn when the waters begin to rise, when swift currents threaten to sweep us away, when fiery paths dog our every step? What words of comfort does the prophet Isaiah offer to Israel, and I would say to us as well, as we face the unexpected trials on this journey through life? Let's start in chapter one, or verse one, excuse me. Chapter 43. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Well, chapter 43 begins with the Lord making what could be a life-changing statement for all of us. Do not fear. He goes on to tell us why. Do not fear, I have redeemed you. Do not fear, I have summoned you by name. Do not fear, you are mine. Do not fear, I am with you. Isaiah uses imagery here of deep waters and fast-moving streams and paths through fire. It's almost like he'd been watching CNN or Fox News. Lately, we've seen lots of coverage of wildfires burning in California, the aftermath of Hurricane Florence leaving behind devastating flooding in her wake. And as you watch these kinds of events unfold, these acts of nature, the one thing that stands out over and over again is that they are totally beyond our control. And just like fires and floods, there are situations and crises that arise in our lives which are also outside of our ability to control. When those things happen, what does the Lord tell us to do? Fear not. Do you know how many fear nots are in the Bible? I didn't either. I asked my friend Alexa, and she told me... um, (laughs) There are over, wow, much bigger laugh, second service. Um, She told me that there are over 365 of them. That means we could have a different fear knot for every day of our life throughout a given year. And I find that pretty encouraging because fear and anxiety are things all of us experience in various degrees. For some, it can be crippling. And to see where all this fear began, you only have to go as far as Genesis 3. Do you remember the first thing Adam says to God after he sinned and eaten the fruit? He says, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Our very sin nature makes it so easy for us to be afraid. But the admonition here in Isaiah is to fear not. Well, I bet some of your Sunday school teachers and Awana leaders tried to instill that in you. Maybe you even remember some of the verses. Let's give it a try. Perfect love casts out all fear. Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a strong mind. Even the life of Christ is sandwiched between two fear knots from his birth to his resurrection. Luke 1.30, And the angel said to her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And then Matthew 25, 8, the women at the empty tomb. And the angel answering said to the women, fear not, for I know that you seek Jesus, the one having been crucified. Well, what is fear really? It's the opposite of faith. And all faith is rooted in trust. For us as believers, trust in the Lord. Look again at what it says here. When you pass through the waters... I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. 
for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The promise here is that God is with us, not just in the sense of being omnipresent, but also walking by our side through the good times and the bad. God is with us. In chapter seven of Isaiah, we see one of the many prophetic verses that points forward toward Jesus, and it says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So God gives all of these amazing promises to the Israelites exiled in Babylon, that he will be with them and lead them through all of these difficult circumstances. And that's true for us as well. If we only put our trust in him, there would be no reason to fear. And even though I know that in my head and in my heart, sometimes my actions don't show that. Sometimes I'm more like Peter. Do you remember the story in Matthew? The disciples are trying to row across the Sea of Galilee. It's nighttime, and the wind and the waves are buffeting the boat. And in the distance, Jesus is walking on the water. And they see him, and they're afraid because they think it's it's a ghost. And Jesus says, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then Peter says, of course this is what Peter would say. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out with you on the water. And Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out on the boat, and he's walking on the water. And I I always feel so bad for Peter because he's out there actually doing it. But then what does he do? He looks around him. He sees the waves. He sees the turbulent waters. He feels the wind on his back, and it says he was afraid. And he began to sink and cried out to the Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and says these heartbreaking words. You of little faith, why did you doubt? To paraphrase, I was right here with you. Why couldn't you trust me? There's a story in the news this summer that I thought was a great example of what it means to trust in the the face of fear. And that was the boys' soccer team from Thailand who got trapped inside a cave complex when the floodwaters began to rise. Now these boys, some of them as young as 11 years old, many of them who could not even swim, allowed their rescuers to take them through dark and murky waters, through dangerously tight spaces, and ultimately to their rescue. If these boys had panicked or struggled against the rescuers, the result would have been disastrous. But they made it through to the other side because they trusted. Well, up until now, We've been looking at these verses about traveling through water and fire in more of a figurative sense, but there are actually two stories from the Old Testament where that imagery is literal, an imagery of passing through water and passing through flame. The first, of course, is Israel being delivered from another bondage, that of the Egyptians, passing through the Red Sea as God parts it open for them. And then in Daniel, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, refusing to bow down before a golden image, being thrown into a fiery furnace, heated up seven times normal than usual. When the doors open, the guards are consumed by the flames. But the three of them pass through those flames unscathed. Well, both of those stories speak of incredible miracles. But God's mighty work isn't limited to just the Old Testament or even to the New. It continues today. I want to tell you a story about a friend of mine. His name is Tim. That's Tim, his wife Gail, his two sons, Connor, and Torin, and Tanya, and myself. I've known Tim for over 35 years. We went to college together, we taught school together, and he worked for many, many years as a beloved science teacher at a Christian school in Pennsylvania. And for the past 30 years, he and his wife and then his family would come visit Tanya and I for a week during the summer. His two boys call us aunt and uncle. Well, 13 years ago, Tim was diagnosed with a rare and deadly form of thyroid cancer. It was a cancer with very few treatment options and an extremely poor prognosis. And as is the case with a lot of rare forms of cancer, it seemed unlikely that there would be any type of experimental treatments available. But as God would have it, a clinical trial specifically for this type of rare cancer had recently begun at a hospital, of all places, just about an hour from his house. 
It's been a long and difficult journey for Tim and his family. And over the past 13 years, his doctors have predicted his passing over and over again. Most recently, about two years ago, when his doctor told him with great certainty that he had two months to live. There have been so many times over the years when it seemed like all hope was gone and a new drug would become available and for a time, Tim's cancer was held at bay. Well, early early on in his cancer journey, um, Tim prayed a prayer that a lot of people thought seemed unanswerable. It was that God would allow him to live long enough to see his boys graduate from high school. I want to read to you from his Facebook page. On June 11, 2018, my oldest son, Connor, will graduate from high school, and God has allowed me to live long enough to see his graduation. Words cannot express how much I love him and how proud I am of how much he has accomplished in his lifetime. This is also a thanks to so many of you who prayed for years that I would live to see this day. As we sang this morning, I've seen you move mountains. I've seen you make a way where there was no way. No one likes going through difficult times. But more often than not, it isn't in the easy times of life when we see spiritual growth. Sometimes the Lord allows us to pass through the flames, through the deep waters, so we can draw close to him. There's a quote from C.S. Lewis that I'm fond of, and it speaks to this. Lewis says, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. In other words, sometimes it takes trials to put our focus back on the Lord. Sometimes the things we learn in our pain, we could never learn in our comfort. And remember, Isaiah doesn't say, if you pass through the waters. He says, when you pass through the waters. It's easy to mouth the words, I trust, when everything is going our way. But it's during the hard times that it becomes real. So if you're in a place today where it feels like the waters are rising, that you're in danger of being swept away by the circumstances of your life, that the flames around you couldn't get any hotter, remember God is with you, walking through every uncertainty of life. There's no need to fear. Well, some of you know my wife Tanya and I have been facing a rough and difficult time on our own journey. In many ways, life as we used to know it has been turned upside down and filled with uncertainty. So this chapter spoke to me on a very personal level. And I wanted to share with you two stories of my own showing how God has been with Tanya and I, calming our own fears through some of our darkest days. And both of these stories are about bluebirds. Well, Tanya and I are bird watchers, and we get a lot of enjoyment watching birds come to our backyard feeders, Sometimes they've nested in our yard. And we have a bluebird house in our front yard, and we had tried for years to get bluebirds to nest there, and it just didn't happen. But last year, finally, a pair did. So we were hoping that this year that would happen again. But as it got later in the breeding season, it didn't seem like that was going to be the case. And then on a day when Tanya was facing one of her lowest points, a pair of bluebirds appeared and began to build a nest in that box. And over the next few weeks, they laid their eggs, their babies hatched, and eventually fledged. We even got to see them fledge, and that doesn't happen very often. What I can tell you is the amount of joy and even distraction from our own circumstances that those bluebirds brought us, it was immeasurable. After the flood, God gave Noah a sign, the rainbow a reminder of his everlasting covenant with his people. I think in times of trial, he does similar things for us, little reminders of his presence, so personal that oftentimes only we would see it. I'm here for you. I haven't gone anywhere. I've got this. Well, the second bluebird is here on this table. Over the past year, Tanya and I have received so much prayer and support and concern from many of you, and this is one example of that. Lois Wills put this together for us. 
And inside, it's filled with handmade, cut-out cardboard feathers. And each of those feathers has a different scripture verse and some encouraging words. The one on the screen says, it's in the waiting room where God does his most holy work. And then when you flip it over, there's a verse and more words of encouragement. This one says, he sees what we cannot see. The refiner's fire makes us holy. There were so many times this year that Tanya and I pulled one of those feathers out of that jar and it spoke to our specific circumstances, things we were facing that day with just the right message that we needed to hear. God offers us reminders of his presence, but he also uses his servants as a means for encouragement. Let's continue in this chapter as God's servant Isaiah once again encourages those in bondage. Verse 14, this is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. For your sake I will send to Babylon and bring down as fugitives all the Babylonians in the ships in which they took pride. I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's creator, your king. This is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses and armies and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness, in streams, in the wastelands. In these verses, God makes a promise to his people that he's going to deliver them from the hand of Babylon and allow them to return to their homeland. And we know from history that that's exactly what happened. But perhaps after living in bondage for so long, the people of Israel would have found this promise of deliverance hard to believe. We know you did great things for us, Lord, in the past, for Abraham, for Moses, for Joshua, but we haven't seen you doing very much lately, and certainly not for us. So God reminds them of his past miraculous deliverance of their very own ancestors from Egyptian bondage, but just as quickly tells them, forget the former things. Don't dwell on them. Why is that? I'll give you a hint. It's the title of this message, and it's also the scripture that our new theme came from. Verse 19, see, I am doing a new thing. Forget the former things, don't dwell on them. In other words, as amazing and miraculous as these past things were, I'm about to do something far greater than you could have ever expected or imagined. And haven't we as a church body already seen that with our Renew campaign? The involvement of Builders for Christ, receiving the largest single monetary gift ever given, a volunteer willing to demolish and haul away the two outside residential buildings, God working in ways we had not anticipated. Well, there's a second promise that God makes to Israel here in addition to their deliverance. It's a promise similar to the one we've already talked about, that he will be with them as they travel down difficult paths. You see, once free from exile, it would be a long journey back to their homeland, much of it through desert in barren land. But God gives them a promise. I'm making a way for you through the wilderness. I'm preparing it ahead of time with streams of water flowing in a wasteland. And although this promise of water very well may have been literal for the people of Israel, figuratively, it's a promise for you and for me as well. Because for most of us here, there will come a time on our journey when we wonder how we're going to be able to survive. A time when we're thirsty and so alone, it feels like we can't take another step. When that happens, remember, there's a pool in the desert where water flows from fountains unseen. They're healing waters and saving waters that will flow over you and me. It's been said that often it's the hard places, the barren places, where God moves to do his greatest work. The bottom line here is we serve a God who is good. And like the good, good father he is, he will protect us 
no matter what, no matter how difficult, no matter how burdensome, no matter how embarrassing, no matter how horrific, God will walk with us through it all. Deliverance rarely comes overnight. And like those captive Israelites, maybe sometimes we too question whether there are things that are just too big for God to change. Things at our work, in our marriage, our finances, our grief, the state of our nation, and on and on and on. When we have those moments of doubts, the Lord says, stop, listen, look, see, I am doing a new thing. God doesn't change, but his ways are often unpredictable. He wants to do a new thing in our lives. Are we open to the possibility that it may be something that takes us down paths we've yet to imagine? Do we have faith and trust enough in him to fear not and move forward in a spirit of expectation? Well, when I began today, I asked the question, can you recall a time in your life where you were absolutely certain something would happen and then it didn't? Well, I want to flip that now, but only think of positive answers with the answer to this question. Can you recall a time, if you're being honest with yourself, when you didn't think there was a chance in the world something would happen, but it did because God made a way where there seemed to be no way? Maybe a change in a hardened heart, deliverance from a sin you'd struggled with for so long, a loved one coming to know the Lord. Or maybe something as seemingly small and insignificant as a bluebird building a nest in your front yard. Or a dear friend offering a kind word of encouragement when you needed it most. Or maybe something so monumental in scope that it defies description other than to call it miraculous, like a father battling a terminal illness, beating the odds and expectations of his doctors to see his teenage son graduate from, co- from high school. The answer to a prayer prayed perhaps against all hope. God is still moving mountains. He's still making ways where there, are no, where there seems to be no way. And I, for one, believe he'll do it again. Well, every time I've been up here, I've closed with a reading of some kind. It's usually something I've found during my preparation that's spoken to me, and I always hope it will speak to some of you as well. So I'm not going to break tradition today. And when I'm finished, I'm going to close in prayer. I'm actually going to pray the serenity prayer, or my version of it. It's something we pray every week at Celebrate Recovery, and I felt led to pray this because CR has been an important part of my life for the past year and a half. My struggles were actually with things like anxiety and fear and trust. The Lord's used that program not only to prepare me for the hard times Tanya and I have faced this year, but I would say also for this very sermon. So if you're struggling with a hurt, a habit, or a hang-up, come join us on Monday night at 6.30. Well, here's my reading. Not yet, he whispers to my anxious heart. Soon, soon I will taste the deliverance of the Lord, the answer to fervent, tearful prayers. So I waited, weeks, months, years, and still I wait. Lord, you and I must have very different perceptions on what soon means. When will the sun rise with joy and healing in its rays? In these dark days of waiting, When my heart feels unchanged, still hurting, still confused, still in need of restoration, remind me that change is gradual, often imperceptible, inscrutable to my child's eyes. Change doesn't happen in one day. But my faithful father is always working. He promises me that change is happening. At this very moment, my heart becomes less bitter, my attitude more freely loving, my life more in line with his glorious image. Perfectly in process, messy, but somehow beautiful. Because there's hope. Hope that even though it feels like nothing is growing in this hard heart of mine, I will someday be able to look back and see his wonderful working and just how far he has carried me. 
It all comes down to trust. Trust in his shepherd's heart. Trust in waiting. The two words I constantly wrestle with as they appear at the corner of every dream and every request. The two words so essential to prayer. Trust and waiting. Let's pray. God, would you grant each one of us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. Give us the courage to change the things we can, as well as the wisdom to know the difference. May we live one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. Help us to accept hardship as a pathway to your peace. And may we take, as your son Jesus did, this sinful world as it is, not as we would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if we would only surrender to your will so that we may be reasonably happy in this life but supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. Thanks for letting me share.